All right, so this is, this is the next part. So here's some vase making instructions if anybody is interested at home. Um, this is how Egyptologists say the vases were made, okay? Step by step. You obtain a stone boulder. Carve a spherical body using dolerite pounders and copper chisels. Pierce the top using a copper tube drill and a hard stone borer. Place in hole on work table, or on home work table. So if you have a work table, otherwise you dig a hole in the ground. Find a piece of flint, hard, 6.5. Secure the flint to a fork stick like in that diagram we saw, which creates a rudimentary drill. Then you hold this really tight and you rotate it left and then right because we need symmetry, obviously. <laughs> Lastly, polish using sand, emery, or hard stone. If you're looking for emery, you can find it on a Greek island called Naxos, but it's not found in Egypt. And if you can't find flint or anything else, you maybe you can use quartz or substitute in another material like that. Sure. This, of course, is ridiculous for stone. Maybe it works for pottery. Uh, I'm sorry, maybe it works for alabaster, but not anything harder than that. So there are serious archaeologists that, that would like better answers, of course. Um, I won't go into all the details, but a lot of them or some of them think that corundum might have been used. That was that nine on the hardness scale. That would cut almost everything we've seen, so it's potentially one explanation. But let's at least answer the question, can granite be cut with bronze tools and abrasives, like corundum quartz, et cetera? The answer is yes, actually it can. It's been demonstrated by Mark Lehner and other people. The problem is it's very slow, extremely slow, and it's not precise whatsoever. You can use primitive tools to cut a piece of rock, and you can carve it into a round ball, but you won't be able to achieve any accuracy or precision. And also, how would you measure that? How do you know if you're, if you're on the right track? Right? For that, we need advanced metrology. So I mentioned that since about 2010 or so, sorry, um, I had been looking for these things. And one day, about eight years ago, when I thought I had a few or I thought I had enough specimens that were, that were good enough, I contacted a company called GOM. Uh, they make metrology equipment for the defense industry, and they had a location up in Connecticut near the sub base in Groton. Um, this is an example of one of the things they make. So this is a structured light scanner. Uh, what it does is it, it allows like a fabricator or a manufacturer to say, all right, I was trying to make something round, or I was trying to make a circle, did I? Was I able to achieve that? How close to a true circle is this thing? And um, you know, can I use it in a machine or a, a robot or in a rocket ship and not? not explode, so quality control effectively. All this device does is it's taking points of an object and it creates this, this thing called a point cloud data set, which is all these data points with an XY coordinates, XYZ coordinate system attached to them. Um, and so this is me going up there in 2017, and you can see that red granite phase on the um, plate inspection table and then two other diorite phases here and here. I love this guy's expression. I, I'm pretty sure it was, so where did you say these came from again? <laughs> this was the first time, at least that I know of, I think any of this, that we had actually used these types of equipment for these types of artifacts. Um, so nobody really knew what to expect. I didn't, I was a little biased because I did think that these were made with some sort of technology. Um, but I didn't know to what extent and we didn't, hadn't have any data before. We created reports on a few of these vessels. We look, just looked at a few key components, like the top, like the sides, a few very simple things. And this is that first red granite, or we call it OG vase sometimes. The top looks flat, but it's not. As you can see, it's actually, it's actually got a radius on it, right? So this results in a convex lip, so it's facing down. Um, that radius is consistent across the entire top surface. In fact, every single surface of this vessel has a radii, and most vessels that we consider, like the ultra-precise vessels, are the same way. There's no flat surfaces. There's, there's curvature and radii throughout. Um, the roundness circularity, at least on the mouth of the opening, also incredibly tight, down to about a thousandth of an inch, one thou. Um, now, we know these are really old, and so they're used by all sorts of people. And I think you can probably see the wear and tear on the bottom right here. So it turns out that even granite will, will drop, will crack and, and splinter if you drop it. Uh, another, another version of that simple report. Around this time, I met Chris Dunn. So his son, Alex, and I started thinking about ways we could expand this. So expand it to look at other components, the interiors and other sections that we found, we found were interesting. Um, and then also get more objects from other people, private collectors, museums, et cetera. Uh, and just as important, bring in engineers, real engineers with real fabrication experience. 
Eric, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Eric Wilson is an engineer, or was an engineer at Rolls-Royce. So he's been instrumental in helping with a lot of this stuff. And then Nick Sierra, who's a metrologist at Rolls-Royce also. Uh, that's Mohammed, Chris Dunn, and me in uh, 2018, I think. So we started looking at more of these vessels and reaching out to engineers and scientists that were receptive. And we did find some, but how do you introduce this subject to the first time, you, you know, to a, an engineer who's never heard about this? Do you say something like, hi, I, I'd like your help proving that um, you know, machines were used to carve space-age granite objects 10,000 years ago. It's like, you're not going to get anywhere. So it's taken us a long time um, to be able to get to the point we're at today, which is to be able to engage with academic institutions. The goal is, is publishing a lot of this work at some point in the near future. It's hard to be patient, but you have to play the game, I guess. Um, this is what metrology means. It's the science of measurement. How do you measure things correctly? So we look at things like flatness, which is the change in elevation. Uh, roundness, which is how true something is to a perfect circle, concentricity and coaxiality. These things can tell you, like, for instance, um, how much the machine might have been moving while it was cutting, uh, how rigid it was, how much friction or vibration was present, maybe how productive the tool was, like how much was it able to remove with each pass. Concentricity and coaxiality can tell you, if, for instance, like several different machine setups were used, like you were stopping and starting. And so if something was done by hand over the course of years, you would expect that measurement to be massive. You were constantly starting, coming back the next day, coming back the next day. Geometry and statistical analysis. Oh, that heading's off. Geometry and statistical analysis, I'm supposed to say. Wall thickness and volume, um, radii and angles, significant ratios like pi, phi, other mathematical constants. And then the radial traversal pattern. This, so this is a pattern found throughout um, some of these vases. And then geometry and design. Is this thing spherical? Is it ellipsoid? One thou or a thousandth of an inch is the same as 25 microns, or about 0 0.02 millimeter. Uh, for comparison, a human hair is maybe between two and four of thou, something like that. So, you know, in some of these vessels, we're seeing tolerances of less than the width of a human hair, sometimes far less. Today, hard igneous rock, like granite, is one of the hardest things on Earth, and mainly used for countertops, veneers, flat surfaces that are easy to work with without too much effort. But what we're seeing is in ancient stone artifacts that are not flat, they have complex, maybe spherical shapes, complex geometry. We're seeing levels of tolerance that are difficult to do today with modern computer-controlled machining and metal. Metal, that is, which is softer than stone, easier for machines to cut and carve. This is India in 2019. This is Chris's home turf. Um, so to do this, we've used different types of equipment. This is a uh, hexagon rover arm, so it's connected to a computer. It doesn't actually scan. It just takes physical me measurements and feeds it back in. Note the granite um, inspection plates. So these machine shops use granite because it's better than metal to work with. It doesn't flex as much. It's more heat tolerant. Um, that's, a, I think, a diorite vase and a porphyry vessel. So what we realized was that almost every surface should be explored. That's how intricate these things are. Nothing was flat. Nothing was random. We also realized that some of these vessels were way more precise than others, right? The, the granites and some of the hardest stone has the highest degrees of accuracy and tolerances. And not all of them appear to be machined. Some of them are just super impressive. This is photogrammetry. Um, we were analyzing one of these like, vases that spin on its base. After Zeiss acquired GOM a few years ago, so Zeiss is another uh, large industrial company, um, Chris Dunn and I, Eric Wilson, um, three of us, I think, it was Chris, me, and Eric, went up to one of their facilities in Michigan to have some of these things scanned by CT scanning equipment, which is effectively x-rays. What you see here is one of those. So this is many times more accurate. It captures a lot more data points, um, including the damage areas that I was mentioning earlier. This is a granite vessel with lug handles that we scanned using that CT scanning equipment from Zeiss. Here's some of the results. So you can see on the right deviations that are roughly between 1 and 6 thou on average. There's a few that are under a thou, though. Uh, pretty interesting to see. And in certain sections, um, yeah, it's, it could be well under 1 thou in certain sections. Again, in metal, this is considered very challenging. Not impossible, but very challenging. This is that original OG vase or the granite vase. Um, using the CT scan data, which is, again, much larger, a, a much bigger data set than you would get from um, pretty much any of the other methods. We see well under 1,000 in many cases. This includes the wear and tear data points, which is interesting because that would be, that's unintended, right? That wouldn't have been there originally. The true numbers could be a lot lower when this thing was actually made. So this is an extreme level of precision. This is possible to do today. We just don't normally do it. Again, in metal, for defense industry applications, sometimes we do, but not in stone. 
um, we might need to invent an entire, entirely new set of, set of equipment and machines. The problem is that some of the machines that are calibrated for metal may break when you're applying them to granite, so they might be able to do this, but it could be expensive if you destroy your machine and, and burn through carbide drill bits and the like. Um, thanks to Ben Van Kirkwick's suggestion back in 2022, late 2022, I think, we released an STL file, which is that point cloud data set, that three-dimensional data file, to anyone that wanted it through his website, Uncharted X. Um, I have a way of, of helping to kind of open source the project a bit. So anyone with the right software could download that file, load it up, and then analyze these in any way they want. Up until this point, we were really only focused on those traditional metrology things that I mentioned on the left side of that last slide. Uh, and not much else, we just had a lot on our plate. A mathematician and cryptographer named Mark Vist, he heard about this and started looking for repeating patterns in the data. Um, and what he found basically fundamentally changed the way we look at these. So their design elements are not random. It turns out it's, it's almost impossible that these are random. These vessels seem to have been expertly designed and then expertly manufactured or made. He noticed that in this case, a flower of life grid overlays pretty nicely on the two-dimensional cross-section of the vase. Um, if you're interested, you can see more on at uh, unsigned.io. Sorry, down there. And so I'll talk a little bit about what he found. So he came up with this term called the radial traversal pattern. Uh, he noticed that there's a really elegant equation to define most of the radii found throughout the vase. So I isolated a couple of these circles here so we can see it. The black, the two black circles here, and then the bigger one here, they have radii. So we'll call this one R3 and R4. We draw a triangle connecting the midpoints of the circles, and then the other vertices here where they intersect. So these triangles are actually Pythagorean special triangles, 45, 45, 90, and 30, 60, 90. Because of that, we know, that we know the, um, the relationship of the sides, right? So we can define the sides in terms of another side that they share in common, and we already know that that's the, the radii. So R4 is the radius of the fourth circle. R3 is the radius of that lower circle. And then on the next slide, they also share that, that horizontal line here. That's the same. So we can take these two things here and here and just set them equal to each other. And then when we reduce this equation, we get this very simple, elegant equation that we call the radial traversal pattern. It's effectively just square root of 1.5 or um, raised to the power of n. n could be any integer. So Mark put this little this, this diagram together to show how that works. If you change the n integer, positive or negative, you get all these other circles. And these radii that are found in these circles are found in other parts of the vase. So this has pretty big implications. This kind of reminds me of like fractals or something. So obviously we can't just make a, a statement like this and walk away, we have to back test it. To do that, um, Mark and Stina, who also works with me at the Artifact Foundation, put together a CAD model based on what they thought these equations represented. So they rebuilt the object in CAD using these equations and then tested the data that that proposed versus the actual data that we had in the STL file, in the scan data file. And what we found is the average tolerance across all the different data points is about 3,000 of an inch or 0 0.075 millimeters. So this is pretty low. It's not zero, but it's very low. Um, the difference could be the limit of the scan. It could be due to the damage again, the wear and tear. We don't know, but it's, it's, it's pretty close. Significant ratios. Um, there's more. So significant ratios, we're talking about mathematical constants, things that you maybe wouldn't expect to find, but you would if they were designed effectively. So pi is an irrational number. It's non-repeating, non-terminating. You can only really define it by circumference over diameter. So you define it by the elements of, um, of a spherical object. It's about 3.16. And phi, which is also known as the golden ratio, it's related to the Fibonacci sequence. It's basically the ratio of line segments. It's about 1.6. We find these throughout a lot of these vessels, a lot of them. So what we're looking for is um, <clears throat> measurements that correlate to these variables. I'll, go, I'll, I'll show you visually in a second what this means. Um, but we can see pi and phi down here. And these are associated with very low tolerances. Here's another image of, of that other vase. So they're, throughout, they're found throughout these vessels. These are just small excerpts for the presentation. So what that actually looks like is we're saying here on the bottom left, this pi equation. So we're saying this is the diameter of D to the radius of R. So D is this outer circle here. And so the diameter of this circle divided by the radius of this inner circle is pi. And over here we have uh, the radius of this 
outside circle, which includes the lug handles, by the way. Maybe the lug handles were for something more than hanging. Divided by the radius of this um, interior larger circle. So this is kind of strange, right? Would we expect to see this? Well, maybe yes, maybe no. Pi is found in spherical, um, in spherical geometry, right? It's part, of, it's part of spherical geometry. And phi is the golden ratio found almost anywhere in nature. But why would two different circles be related like this, right? If we space these out more, if we, in, if we increase or decrease this width here, meaning one of the circles was slightly bigger or slightly smaller, this no longer holds. So it appears that it was almost definitely designed this way. Um, why? All right, why is a good question. <laughs> I don't know, but it could have something to perhaps, here's a couple of speculatory answers. Maybe it has something to do with the machine, the way the machine was designed and set up. Maybe the way the machine was um, you know, calibrated or adjusted perhaps just resulted in this. I don't know. It could have something to do with the form. Phi is, you know, the sacred, <clears throat> excuse me, it's associated with sacred geometry and beauty. It's found in art. That could be something to do with it. It just looks better if we use these concepts, maybe. Or it could be related to the form, excuse me, the function. Could these have been functional objects? Could they have been part of something bigger, components in a machine, maybe? Chris Dunn has speculated that these were Helmholtz resonators, maybe components of the Great Pyramid, the ascending passage. Um, I don't know, but it seems like they were definitely designed for some reason. 